first five books of the Bible have been instructing and guiding human, humanity for millennia. But now with the advent of powerful computers, it's possible that there are more messages in there than we ever realized. This is Skywatch TV for Monday, March 7th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. And joining me in studio today, a special guest here filming a couple of future episodes of Skywatch TV, the full 30-minute program, uh, the man behind Pinlight LLC, producer and director of Torah Codes Into Darkness, Richard Shaw. Richard, thanks for joining us today. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Derek. We will get into some of the specifics of the Torah Codes and the whys and the, and the wherefores on the full Skywatch TV program coming up in April. But uh, sure. um, the the researchers, the rabbis who are doing this research in Jerusalem and finding what appeared to be coded messages uh, embedded in the original Hebrew text of the Bible are finding some really finding messages that appear to be well outside the bound of random chance. Um, there's one that was really intriguing to me that you emailed me about the other day, and this is uh, the number 1820 and its appearance and its significance in the Torah codes. Explain, what is so special about the number 1820? Well, uh, the rabbis refer to it as the secret number of God. You go, hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah. But the re reason why they call it secret is because it's, it's a... Uh, it's, it's using gematria to get that number. And the way that they do that is the, the word for God has a number of 26 mm -hmm. in the Hebrew text. And the word, the Jewish word for secret in Hebrew has the number 70. So if you multiply 26 by 70, you get the number 1820. So you go, oh, okay, that's another crazy number. <laughs> Wacky Jewish, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. mythology. Mythology, yes. But, it, but it's really incredible when you really <laughs> venture into it. Um, the first word of the book of Genesis where it's in the beginning, you know, God created adds up to the number 1820. If you count the number of characters all the way through the creation sequence in the book of Genesis, you know, up through the, like the third chapter or somewhere in that area, it's 1820 characters. Hmm. If you multiply, if you count up all the number of sentences during the story of creation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of that, into where Moses starts to give you the law in the book of Exodus, it's 1,820 sentences. Hmm. If you add up all the words that Jacob said, along with his wives, Leah and uh, Rachel, it's 1,820 words. Huh. So, I mean, at a certain point you go, wait a minute, this is just blowing my mind because mm -hmm. there's way too much for it to be considered just mere coincidence. So now what's happening is in the Torah codes, Rabbi Glazerson is looking up uh, things that are happening now and he's getting Torah codes that have words in it that have a skip of 1,820 characters. Hmm. And he's getting like several words that all refer to the same thing in parallel to each other, which is like, you know, uh, we've been doing this for years. I've been following what they've been doing and while I don't understand all of the ancient Hebrew uh, ramifications involved or, or what sometimes uh, is important to Rabbi Glazerson that he has to explain to me the idea that all these words could appear with the same ELS skip is uh, pretty astonishing mm -hmm. <laughs> because the odds of making that happen are, are huge. Yeah. Now ELS for people not familiar with that acronym. That's equidistant letter sequencing. So basically it's it's a skip code. So mm -hmm. I'm going to skip a number of letters and then I'm going to have another letter and then I'll skip more letters and have another one. Mm -hmm. And in this case you're skipping 1,820 characters between letters. Hmm. Now, I, I guess a question that, that needs to be asked because I know that there were people who will look at this and, and wonder how this differs from fortune telling or trying to divine the future. How do, how do we as Christians process this? I mean, this is fascinating and it's undeniable that these are present and that they defy the laws of chance and probability. But how do we as Christians process this? Well, I think it's just, it, it's part, to me, it, it, we go back to what we were talking about in one of the shows that we did earlier today. And that is in the book of Daniel where it says, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. How do you seal a book? Well, we do this all the time with emails and everything else. We mm -hmm. encrypt our information so nobody can read it. Right, right. That's a way of sealing it. It's not like getting out wax and stamping it because, you know, we're talking about, you know, thousands of years after it was actually written. How in the world would you seal something that everyone's been reading for thousands of years? The only way you could do that is to encrypt information into it that now we know how to get it out. Mm -hmm. 
And through these ingenious mathematicians, um, they've been able to do that. I think there's a lot to that. You know, every one of them believes that we're living in the end of days. Now, people have thought that also for centuries, too. They've thought it in the first century, right. Except for the fact we've never seen so many things happen in the world like we are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is in utter chaos pretty much anywhere you turn. Europe is a mess. Uh, the Middle East is a complete mess. You know, you've got Saudi Arabia amassing troops. You've got Turkey coming down. And, and Turkey's actually talking to Israel now, trying to make peace again, mm -hmm. which is yeah. really like, what? Yeah, just, you know? not, just a coincidence that Israel's found all this natural gas out in the Mediterranean. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and even Egypt has been helping Israel by flooding Hamas's tunnels for them. Yes. I mean, so, so there's weird alliances and weird hatreds and stuff that doesn't make sense and spiritual stuff and all this stuff that's just going on here in the U.S. It's like unexplainable sometimes. It's like, what? why are they doing that? Mm-hmm. One of the things that keeps coming up, and we, we see this in news coming out of Israel on an almost weekly basis, mm -hmm. another proclamation from a, a rabbi, orthodox or ultra-orthodox rabbi, of signs or prophetic fulfillment that the Messiah is due to arrive. Now, of course, they believe he's not been here yet. We as Christians understand he's coming back. Um, what are they seeing in the codes that might shed light on... Um, the Messiah's arrival, what, frame, what time frame are they pointing to? They've been uh, feverishly looking up codes for the return of the Messiah, and the codes that keep coming up are 5776, which is 2016, which mm -hmm. is this year. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, we can't make such predictions. Right. And, and they know that too, except for the fact we don't understand why this is happening. We have to ask the question, of why does this number keep appearing in so many code tables? I mean, it's an inordinate a number of tables and ancient texts that talk about this year. I'm going clear back to the film that came on in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. Even Tom Horn wrote a book, you know, Zenith 2016, right? which I was just looking at last night because he gave me a copy of it while we were here. And I'm going, this is like, he's even working on it. You know, yes. so I'm going like, okay, I, this I didn't realize and I should have known, but I didn't realize he was so deep into the 2016 thing as well. So there's something going on with this year. I mean, this year is a year of massive instability everywhere we look. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's when, I mean, the Jews say, when we are desperate enough for the Messiah, he'll return. That's mm. something that they say. Mm. Now, to, to be fair, we should point out that one of the tables that you were, you were sent by Rabbi Glazerson indicated possibly that the Messiah was to arrive on what would have been December 22nd on our calendar of this past year. That was Elijah, he said. Or Elijah, okay, yeah. all right. Um, and because they believe that Elijah will be foretelling, you know, will be here heralding the sure. Messiah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, an Old Testament thing. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know. I mean, could it have been that Elijah appeared and only appeared to a few people secretly, privately? I don't know. I have no way of knowing such a thing. Yeah. But it came up in a lot of tables, December 22nd, that, mm. that appeared over and over again. It's even in my website on the Torah codes, endtodarkness.com, where people could see that for themselves, that clip. I have no, uh, I have no explanation for it. Yeah, and we do know that uh, uh, there are sometimes messengers interfered with by um, messengers of the enemy or, or agents of the enemy. Yeah, the we Prince of the, Persia thing. Right, yeah. in, the, in the book of Daniel. Right. Um, what was, in, in the work that you've done and the, uh, the friendships that you've made with these, uh, these gentlemen studying the, these, um, uh, these codes, what, what is the most surprising thing that they have shared with you? Well, one of the really surprising table was one that, that uh, Rabbi Glazerson did back in February, a month before um, Netanyahu was elected, back when all of the news media was telling us Oh, he's never going to be elected. You know, he's, uh, it's very close. The race is really close. And so Glazerson did a table to see if Netanyahu came up in the Torah codes at mm -hmm. all. And it said, we'll be elected. Uh, it gave the date, uh, it was March 17th, I think it was. Um, all these things, it says B.B. Netanyahu. His whole name mm. was written in the, in the Torah codes and other scriptures in the plain text were, were surrounding it. And we knew that on, Mar on February 9th. Uh, and then we heard all of this news media nonsense, and he was reelected by a major landslide. So mm -hmm. the, the Torah code in that particular case seemed rather prophetic. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time. 
and we're not supposed to use it in that respect, but sometimes the Torah could gives us hints on mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. There, there was an incident recently that, uh, and, and maybe we can spend a couple of minutes on this, where a 15 year old boy in Israel uh, had a near death experience and shared some information with some of the rabbis that they found somewhat surprising. Right, that was up yeah. all over YouTube. Mm-hmm. His name is Nathan. He had a near death experience, and uh, anybody can just go to YouTube and find this. It's about an hour long. Mm-hmm. It was very, very in depth. And he's sitting there uh, in a room surrounded with rabbis asking him questions. Mm-hmm. And you have to look at that and go, how could this 15 year old kid know all of this information? I mean, it went clear into World War III. It came, it went into the return of the Messiah, and it, was it near, you know, near? Uh, what happens to Obama? I mean, it was like, it was just incredible information. And he said that World War III will start with a bang, he said. Mm -hmm. Well, it uh, is clear from what the the information that they've been sharing with you and the uh, information that Tom collected in Zenith 2016, which, by the way, will be a program coming up on Skywatch TV in just a couple of weeks, uh, that there have been quite a few people going back centuries that have pointed to the period of time in which we live right now yeah. as being significant for some reason and may not be clear until we're all, all the way through it and on the other side. I mean, this goes clear back to the Vilna Gaon in the 17th century, you know, a famous uh, Jewish mathematician who believed that the Torah was the blueprint of creation, essentially. And coming up with this idea that something was going to happen this year mm-hmm. when Russian ships would make their way down the Strait of, of, of uh, Bosphorus. Bosphorus. Yeah, yeah, I can never <laughs> pronounce it correctly. But I mean, that's really, it's already happened as yes. far as I, as I know. And well, I, they've been going through there for a while, but I mean, the, the significance of this was that uh, there, it, he prophesied a conflict with Turkey where the Russians would be at the gates of, uh, well, Istanbul, right. which has not happened yet. But he also said that Russia would take the Crimea and of course, that did happen. Yeah. Russia took it from Ukraine in March of 2014. And now we've heard that there's Russian destroyers in the Mediterranean right, armed right. with uh, nuclear tipped cruise missiles. And right, and there was a, a, almost an international incident when one of those Russian ships went through the Bosphorus and Turkish of- officials spotted a uh, Russian sailor on deck with a man pad which is a, a shoulder-fired missile they could bring down a plane. Oh. Yeah, because the Russians, at, this was not long after Turkey shot down that uh, Russian plane yeah. over Syria. So wow. yeah. uh, Russia has never really retaliated for that yet. Yeah. But Russians don't forget very easily. No. So, yeah, think, we're definitely living in interesting times. Yeah, it's just everything's on a hair trigger. Yes. Well, uh, Richard Shaw will be a guest on Skywatch TV coming up for a couple of programs in the month of April. So do watch for that. Again, he is the producer and director of the film Torah Codes, End to Darkness, his website, endtodarkness.com. Coming up this week on Skywatch TV, Nita Horn describes the inspiration for her new memoir. It's very moving, very touching. I will freely admit I didn't make it through the introduction before I needed the Kleenex. Uh, mm-hmm. Sharon said uh, our dachshund was traumatized because she was weeping so hard at the uh, stories that Nita relates. The uh, book is called No Fences, and you'll see that this week on Skywatch TV. Today, 8.30 p.m. on the Victory Television Network. That's in Arkansas and around Memphis. Tomorrow, twice on Tuesday, Victory Television Network, 6.30 p.m., and the Christian Television Network, Coast to Coast, on Satellite TV at 8.30 p.m. All these times are central, by the way. The Cornerstone Network, Wednesday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. and then next Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, 3.30 p.m. on the Victory Television Network, 7.30 p.m. on the Christian Television Network, and for a complete channel listing, log on to skywatchtv.com. And during the month of March, for your financial support of $20 or more, we'll offer to you a very timely gift, a book by uh, Alan Keyes, former U.S. Ambassador, candidate for president, uh, about the court system. Of course, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia recently passing, called America's Courts Progress and Peril. That plus a commemorative plaque. Um, these uh, gifts uh, retail normally for $40. Our gift to you for your financial support of $20 or more during the month of March. My email address for your comments, questions, and suggestions, dgilbert at skywatchtv.com. And we thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. From the time she was little, Nita dreamed of horses. Every childhood fantasy rode on the back of a heroic white steed, coming to save the day. 
I don't know how long I've had this love in my heart for horses. It's just always been there. And when we were little girls, my sister and I would play all day long. I was always the white horse and she was always the little pink pig. Let's pretend lightning and Rosie can fly. <laughs> But everything changed in a heartbeat. On December 9th, 1971, a tragic car accident claimed the life of my dad and my best friend and my little sister. And I wondered after that if there was anything left to believe in. As a child of 13, I felt like I had lost practically everything. And I wondered, is this it? I mean, where do I go from here? I could not have imagined back then how God could use horses, of all things, to restore my faith and vision for the future. Starting April 19th, get your copy of Nita Horn's inspirational new book, No Fences, and learn for the first time her amazing story of loss, survival, determination, and healing. How the vision and love God gave her for these beautiful and majestic animals eventually led to the 150-acre Whispering Ponies Ranch, a general retreat facility, as well as a premier training location that specializes in using and gifting therapeutic animals to benefit the herding, other care facilities, schools and ministries across the nation. When God puts something in your heart, it's there for a lifetime. Book of Genesis, you know, up through the, like the third chapter or somewhere in that area, it's 1,820 characters. Hmm. If you multiply, if you count up all the number of sentences during the story of creation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of that, into where Moses starts to give you the law in the book of Exodus, it's 1,820 sentences. Hmm. If you add up all the words that Jacob said along with his wives Leah and uh, Rachel, it's 1,820 words. Huh. So, I mean, at a certain point you go, wait a minute, this is just blowing my mind because mm -hmm. there's way too much for it to be considered just mere coincidence. So now what's happening is in the Torah codes, Rabbi Glazer said, The first five books of the Bible have been instructing and guiding human humanity for millennia. But now with the advent of powerful computers, it's possible that there are more messages in there than we ever realized. This is Skywatch TV for Monday, March 7th, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert and joining me in studio today, a special guest here filming a couple of future episodes of Skywatch TV, the full 30 minute program. Uh, the man behind Pinlight LLC, producer and director of Torah Codes, Into Darkness, Richard Shaw. Richard, thanks for joining us today. It's nice to be here. Thank you, Derek. We will get into 
and is looking up uh, things that are happening now, and he's getting Torah codes that have words in it that have a skip of 1,820 characters. Hmm. And he's getting like several words that all refer to the same thing in parallel to each other, which is like, you know, uh, we've been doing this for years. I've been following what they've been doing. And while I don't understand all of the ancient Hebrew uh, ramifications involved or, or what sometimes uh, is important to Rabbi Glazerson that he has to explain to me, the idea that all these words could appear with the same ELS skip is uh, pretty astonishing mm -hmm. <laughs> because the odds of making that happen are, are huge. Yeah. Now, ELS, for people not familiar with that acronym, some of the specifics of the Torah codes and the whys and the, and the wherefores on the full Skywatch TV program coming up in April. But uh, sure. um, the, the researchers, the rabbis who are doing this research in Jerusalem and finding what appear to be coded messages uh, embedded in the original Hebrew text of the Bible are finding some really finding messages that appear to be well outside the bound of random chance. Um, there's one that was really intriguing to me that you emailed me about the other day, and this is uh, the number 1820 and its appearance and its significance in the Torah codes. Explain, what is so special about the number 1820? Well, the, the rabbis refer to it as the secret number of God. You go, hmm. oh. <laughs> Yeah. But the re reason why they call it secret is because it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's using gematria to get that number. And the way that they do that is the, the word for God has a number of 26 mm -hmm. in the Hebrew text. And the word, the Jewish word for secret in Hebrew has the number 70. So if you multiply 26 by 70, you get the number 1820. So you go, oh, okay, that's another crazy number. <laughs> Wacky Jewish, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. mythology. Mythology, yes. But, it, but it's really incredible when you really <laughs> venture into it. Um, the first word of the book of Genesis, where it's in the beginning, you know, God created, adds up to the number 1,820. If you count the number of characters all the way through the creation sequence in the 